interested in doing a presentation on um, GT6 and I ended up broadening the topic a little bit and just to talk about some of the other things I, I have been doing. Um, as, as, as you will hear a bit later, whilst the website is stale, um, that doesn't mean nothing's happening, it just means that Paul's lazy. Um, so next slide, please, Web is driving. Is that you, Martin? So a bit, bit of an agenda. I'm assuming you've got the agenda slide. Um, yes, agenda. So yeah. some, some background on... Um, oh, sorry, I'll just click to the next slide too. Um, some background on, I guess, when I started using OS2 and, 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 and things, um, what sort of hardware and software I'm currently using. I've already alluded to the, to the website status, a little bit of an update on UniOrg, Apache, uh, the GCC compiler, Samba, and the bulk of the slides are on QT6, and I think I was going to um, do an expanded agenda on that section, and I ran out of time. So I think, Martin, you'll find the next slide in the copy you've got is a duplicate of um, this slide, which I've deleted locally, but um, didn't read in this morning. Oh, but the slide that says background? Yes. Yes. Yep, cool. So I actually had to really scratch my head and think. Um, I think I started using OS2, it was about 93 or 94. I was at, at university um, and OS2 2.1 for Windows came out. So, I, you know, I already had a Windows license and, you know, didn't want to pay for another one. Um, so I, I did start around then. So whenever that came out, whether that was 93 or 94, that, that's when I started using um, OS2 2.1. Um, in terms of software ports, again, I had to really scratch my head because in my head I thought it was earlier than this, but um, I think the story was someone had done some work with um, the same application to support some USB scanners. And it, I think from memory it had like a bespoke device driver and only supported a limited number of scanners. And around the, around the same time, NetLabs had um, produced the USB calls library, which um, you know, made using the IBM USB driver a lot easier. And they had some stuff working. I think it was G Photo, the digital camera, you know, back in the days when you had to transfer photos off of digital cameras. Um, and I thought, oh, how hard can it be to use that same library to get scanners working? And I'd done a little bit of C programming in uni, in, in first year engineering. And how hard can it be? I can do this. And, you know, orders of magnitude of time later, because as I tell people, I'm not a programmer, I'm a hacker. I just keep fisting around until something works. Um, and in those days, we didn't have Google. These days, Google is a, is, is a lifesaver. Um, but I managed to get um, my Epson scanner working and got a whole bunch of other Epson scanners working. And it's like, this is cool. Um, yeah, I'm not really watching the other window, Martin. But, um, sorry, one thing I should, uh, should say, if people have got questions or anything, please just interrupt me. I'm not precious. I know we've lost some time, but um, I tend to talk too fast. so. Um, I'll probably get through these slides in no time. Um, and yeah, I guess since 20, 2005, I've worked on a bunch of stuff, and there's a bunch of stuff that is on my website. A lot of it is stale, a lot of it's overcome, as we say in defence, overcome by events. Um, you know, there's newer ports in RPM and things, um, but the ones I've done are still there for, for, I guess, posterity, if nothing else. And in some cases, um, things in RPM might be broken and my old version might still work. So next slide, if you can, Martin. And I'll just advance as well. Yes, yes, done. Yep. So it, again, I struggled to remember when I when, at, what, at which point I got sick of walking upstairs to, to to power up the desktop machine and 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 do stuff on the computer, and when I got lazy and started using you know uh, virtualized solutions. Um, but fair to say, up until late last year, um, and my guess was about seven years, um, pretty much everything I've done is in VirtualBox. So I have a, a, a hack to death um, VirtualBox instance running with about a hundred gig um, development partition on it. Um, pretty much all of that is using stuff that I've compiled myself, not using RPM. Um, and fair to say, it's become quite high maintenance um, that environment. So when I started working on QT. Um, and some of the stuff in QT, as we'll hear later, takes a bloody long time to build. The, you know, the browser is something like 30 hours. Um, you know, so leaving the, the laptop running with a virtualized instance for 30 hours is, is a pain in the neck. Um, so I did actually, through this year, I guess, um, purchase some native hardware. Um, and 
one of the systems I'm running, and probably the one that's doing most of the work right now, is a Lenovo ThinkCenter Tiny um, that has one of those little HDMI um, fake adapter things that makes the computer think the screen's um, attached. Uh, plugged into the back of it so that it effectively it runs headless. So it runs um, Andre's VNC um, server. Um, so I can very easily from the laptop um, and whether I'm at home or down in our holiday house um, through VPN, you know, attach that box and, and set it going and it can happily chug away for as long as it needs to um, without any um, interference. That is still running Arca OS 5.08 mainly because I haven't had time to, uh, to, to upgrade it. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, in terms of laptops, um, the, the one that I'm looking at right now, it's about a two-year-old Lenovo, um, 11th gen, which I think 14th gen might be current now, but again, it works, and it's running running Ubuntu, uh, which is what I tend to use that today. Next slide, please, Martin. Done. Yep, as I said, I'm pretty lousy at updating website. Um, that tends to be someone will comment on a mailing list, hey, this hasn't been updated for a while, and I'll build it, and I'll wait for feedback. And in the theory being that if I get feedback saying that it works, you know, at least as well as the previous version, then I'll update the website. And in some cases, people don't provide feedback. Um, and in other cases, I just get busy and forget. Um, so probably most things these days, um, I will post on OS2 World. So if, if you don't read OS2 World, um, you're missing out, so gratuitous plug for you, Mark. Um, and as I said, yeah, no feedback um, means I'm probably not going to put a link on the website. So looks like the last things I actually uploaded there were of March 22, just looking at my change log. Although I did put a, a sort of a header post on there pointing to the OS2 world threads on QT6 um, about this time last year. So, next slide, please, Martin. I'm just trying to... Uni hour. Should have got a mouse. Uh, so UniOrd. Um, so I first started playing with UniOrd, just again, just looking at some change logs and some build dates around 2008. So um, when that was a Netlabs project originally, um, I think it was Vlad who was working on it. He seemed to like to cherry pick, you know, one file from one version of UniOrd, another file from another version of UniOrd, and he cobbled things together and sort of made it work, but it made maintenance a nightmare because the code wasn't against the common baseline. Um, so I did a bunch of work back then, um, getting all the source files that are used to compile up to a common um, code level, which then made future maintenance uh, a lot easier. Um, but then sort of left uni... Oh, sorry, I've lost my ear, but... Hopefully I haven't broken that. Um, yeah, so I, I left the uni order load for a while after that. Um, other people were, were in there maintaining the code, so there was no real need. But I think in a, a couple of walk stops, walk stops ago, um, Lewis talked about some future work to um, you know, upgrade the uh, you know the driver level of, of uni order to support more modern hardware. And I guess that sort of lit a fire, and it's like, oh, I wonder how hard it would be to update um, uni order from, uh, from using the old ELSA 1.0.24 code. Um, and at some point, that code moved from being a, a standalone kernel module into the main Linux module, and they reorganized the code quite significantly, and I spent a bit of time and worked out where all the files had gone, and soon enough, it bumped the code up to you know, basically a current uh, Linux uh, uh, code level, which allows it to support a lot more hardware. Probably the big limitation in UniOrd at the moment is that um, uh, any any audio using HDMI is in the too hard basket for now. Um, which I think there's, there's certainly some hardware out there that doesn't have a, a PCI audio card that only has a HDMI output. So the current builds out there are using Linux 6.1, which is a long-term support kernel. I think that was released at the end of last year, so I think that's supported for about four or five years, and not a whole lot of new hardware gets added to it, but there is um, bug fixes in there. So the to-do there is to convince Lewis and David to um, update the code in AOS. Um, I think the current UniOrd there is based on Linux 5.15, which is yeah, two or three years old now. Next slide, please, Martin. So, Apache, um, not, I don't know how many people are actually running 
actually you'll notice too versus running it on you know, Raspberry Pis or, or, or other things. Um, but I am still doing a bit of work on Apache and PHP. Um, first built PHP 4.4 way back when uh, using the KLibC library um, based on Brian Hubbard's work. He had previous ports using um, EMX and the current ports were on the, almost the latest Apache 2.4 and PHP, I'm maintaining 7.4, essentially for Lewis. Um, and I do have a port as well of um, 8.2. 8.3 was recently released, but I just haven't had a chance to um, spend any time on it. Um, better say, yeah, a lot of the recent fixes that have helped stability um, have come from Stephen. Um, you'll probably hear his name a few times through here, the, you know, the, the help he offers, um, even at times, just as a sounding board has been um, invaluable. Um, but you know, as with a lot of other software, PHP can use a lot of memory um, and memory exhaustion, which is a common theme, is, is a real challenge um, in terms of you know keeping the operating system stable. Right, quick question on yeah. Apache. Yes, yeah, sure, Neil. Yeah, uh, so I at one point I tried Apache and I was trying to connect it to something called Jetty uh, application server, and it would start to fill out my new page and it would just stop. And I wondered, it sounded like Stephen found that, but I really couldn't understand what you two were doing. Is there a chance that it's worth trying again? I'll admit, I, I, I don't specifically recall that. Um, Neil, how long ago do you think that was? Uh, that was four years ago that I was uh, trying to do that. If it was four years ago, yes, probably, probably worth trying. Um, probably, I'd have to guess, and Lewis may have a better memory than me if he's in the room, but um, it was probably 12 months ago, we did quite a bit of work on trying to fix some of the bugs um, around stability. So um, yeah, if it, if it was more than 12 months ago, yes. um, probably worth retrying. And um, yeah, there's the uh, ECSI. Yeah, I think it is still ECSISP um, mailing list, which has some of the usual suspects on who you know um, can, can help diagnose that. If, if it's still a problem. Okay, well, thank you. There, there is actually another person in the world that's using your Apache port. Mensa still runs on the patch on OS2, believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> I know Massimo does, um, and Massimo is always having trouble, but. Um... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you get feedback. Uh, next. <laughs> oh, sorry. But you get feedback. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not always terribly constructive feedback, but yes, feedback. <laughs> uh, next slide, please, before I get in trouble. <laughs> okay, GCC, yeah. So yeah, G GCC. Um, this, I guess, was another one when where uh, you know Newt had sort of um, locked in GCC three point three point five into Libc, and I was think at the time I was building some stuff and. Um, there was something fixed in a newer GCC, so again, it was one of those classics, how hard can it be to upgrade GCC, and turns out in some cases harder than I thought, but um, essentially since GCC 3.4, I think I've built just about every version up to and including 12.3 um, since then. Um, GCC 13, I have had a look at. Um, it drops um, support for the Stabs um, uh, debug um, language, which is a problem for us. Um, and it looks like with GCC 13, we're going to have to think about changing object formats and things. And there's a lot of work there to upgrade uh, tool sets and things. And yeah, I don't have time right now for, for something like that. Um, in terms of GCC, at, at one point, Bitwise adopted um, largely the work I've done on GCC 4.9. And at some point after that, um, they updated to 9.2. Um, I'm using GCC goals for most of the stuff that um, that I'm working on, um, and I have I did put it here. Yeah, and I have um, did stick on OS2 World some versions of that that are um, I guess more compatible with RPM, so that they're not um, they're relying on the layout that I have on on my build environment. Oh, I did talk here. Yeah, so GCC 13 not working needs an updated linker for one thing, um, and tools uh, yeah a dot a dot out, which is a very old object format. Um, is no longer supported in the repository, so it basically requires hacks to get it to work. Or, you know, reinstating a whole bunch of code that was dropped out in the GCC 12 to 13 transition, which again is just not something that I have time for in the in the in the near future. Believe it or not, I do have a day job. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. So Samba, um, I think NetLabs um, paid, and I think it was Nick Kay. Um, again, I was really scratching my memory putting some of this stuff together. Um, he put together a report on uh, uh, of Samba 3.09, you know, back in the day. Um, I was trying to run that as a, as a server at home and had lots of issues with um, EA support and looking at some of the, um, you know, the, the Samba repositories and mailing lists and things. There were a number of EA fixes post 3.09, so I, I got helped get that up to I think it was 3.025 at the time. And um, a, again, um, other people stepped up to that. So I know uh, Herwig and Sylvan um, did a lot of work on Samba um, back in the day, and I sort of left it alone for a number of years until Lewis, Lewis one day in sort of 2013, 2014, came to me to say, hey, you know, we have a, a corporate client who's interested in Samba 4. How hard would it be? Um, and cut a long story short, um, I had managed to get uh, um, enough of Samba at the time built to um, enable an updated NetDrive client that supported um, SMB2, SMB2 um, and that's now included in Arca OS. Um, I have updated parts of the so there is a server um, um, version of that as well that's not yet included in Arca OS. Um, I do need to try and get that uh, updated, but you know, fair to say. The bulk of my time in the last 12 months have been um, hitting six, um, bar a sort of divergence into uh, uh, updating some modules for a system called OpenHack, which I use to do some uh, home automation. My home, I changed the electricity provider to one that uses wholesale pricing, so I had to write some Java code to suck in the pricing so that I could use that to automate some stuff in my house, um, which is yeah, a bit interesting playing around with Java. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. GT6. GT6. <laughs> so I, I did do it. Uh, turns out I did a bit of an agenda later on in the in, in fact. I obviously must have changed my mind from when I had that duplicate slide. So just a little bit on uh, what is it, um, what my aims were, uh, progress. Um, I actually know this isn't an agenda. I forget now. Um, so yeah, the build system completely changed between QT5 and QT6. QT5 used QMake. Um, to build the entire library. Um, with QT6, they went to CMake, and of course, um, our current port of CMake at the time wasn't new enough, so there was some work required on CMake. Um, all the code for QT6, bar you know, some local commits on my box that aren't worth committing yet, uh, are in GitHub. And I guess the, the, the key thing I wanted to make clear here is um, this would not have been possible without the work that Bitwise had done on QT5. You know, you know, the, the changes that were required excluding the build system, um, you know, 90% of that was lifted straight from the QT5 repository or adapted from the QT5 repository. And ignore the comment that it says sub bullet because that's what the typo. I obviously had, to, had, a, had a thought there and then didn't come back to it. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. What is so, it? yeah, Q, QT6 um, is, is the latest version of the, of the QT library. Um, QT4 and 5 Previously, we worked on Pi Dimitri. Um, QT5 is the basis for work on the updated browser that Bitwise have been working on for the last little while. Um, key point here is that you know, the, the DLLs between the different QT versions aren't compatible. Um, they have different names, they have different APIs. Um, so applications you know, need to be ported to QT6. It's not, if you have an old QT5 app and you want to test QT6, you know, you install them both in parallel um, and the, you know, the DLL names are different, they won't clash. But yeah, things do need to be recompiled. It's not a um, drop-in replacement. Next slide, please, Martin. Um, what was I trying to do about this time last year when I started working on this? Um, so one was the work on QT5 installed, and you know I think most people are aware of what happened with Dimitri last year um, with the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, I tried building QT5 to see if I could help on some issues, and I had some issues. And um, again, a recurring thing here, how hard can it be to update from QT5 to QT6? I'll give it a crack and, you know, again, with the thought that at some point, a bit like the work on GCC, um, the work could be, you know, uh, lifted by, by Bitwise at some point and, and leveraged. Um, oh, I did say that. Yeah, so, yeah, how hard can it be? 
sometimes forget <laughs> when I put in a slide and start talking and then realise I've said what was coming up next to the next point. <laughs> that next slide, please, Martin. M must be my morning coffee has uh, had too, too big an impact. So, why QT6? Because. Um, so, I did stick a link in here. Uh, some of this stuff is from um, the QT6 website. website. So, it, they're leveraging uh, more features in C++17, um, updated versions of, or updated generation of QML, which is one of the markup languages in QT. There's a new graphics architecture, which probably doesn't help us. Um, unify 2D and 3D for, for QT Quick, which again, the 3D, the 3D probably doesn't help us. Um, CMake Build System, which probably been one of the biggest, frankly, pain in the asses, um, where QMake is still supported for applications that still want to use it. And as, as and in the classic words of uh, the QT organisation, multiple improvements throughout. So there, that's with a, a, a chocolate from the from the QT6 uh, website. The next slide, please, Martin. So progress. I, I, I decided that if I was going to do anything, that I, you know, the main thing I wanted to do was keep people in the loop of what was happening. So um, I debated at the time, you know, do I make a bit of progress before I say I'm working on it, so that if you know, if it all gets too hard and I chuck it in, there's no shame or embarrassment from, you know, having promised the world and delivered nothing. Um, but wrongly or wrongly, you know, pretty early on, I think I've just established the repository and started applying patches that I started to thread. And now Martin would have to um, confirm, but that, that thread has nearly 80,000 views and 800 replies as of when I created this slide um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, certainly of the threads I've looked at, Martin, that's probably one of the most trafficked or viewed threads in recent times on OS2 World. Um, I would wager in terms of replies and things. And yes, it's a long-standing thread and there's a lot of probably noise on there, but um, yeah, at least on face value, there is a decent amount of interest in, in QD6. Um, so it's a fair bit of work, firstly, um, creating diffs or differentials of the code. Um, a bit wise's work on 5.15 and then um, applying those patches to the QD6. You know, as, as all these software guys like to do, they like to move code that was in this folder to here and um, so things don't apply cleanly, and then at first you think, oh, that, that must just be not present and not important, and then later on you discover, actually, there's a bug here, and if I'd applied those patches from back here, um, it would have you know, made, made things a lot easier. Um, but yeah, there was a significant amount of work in, in resolving conflicts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the build system also changed, and seemed like it be updated. And there's a tool out there called Node.js, um, which in the version of QT5 that Bitwise originally worked on wasn't required, um, but as Dimitri found out when he updated the code from 5.15.7 to 5.15, whatever it was, and the Chromium version went up, um, he also Node.js. So uh, he's working, I, I think I ported Node.js 12, he's working on Node.js 18. Um, he's hit a bug, which is basically the same bug that I've now got in JavaScript, in, which is part of QT5. Um, but yeah, that's something that needed to be, needed to be also ported, and that was not a um, not an insignificant amount of effort to uh, get Node.js working. I think that was a you know, a week of my Christmas holidays last January, um, getting that working on and off. Next slide, please, Martin. So in terms of um, some of the progress, so the QC base, which is um, I guess one of the key um, key modules. Please, you, Roderick. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the key modules in there's like three people in the room whose names I know. So, <laughs> um, QT base includes things like the the, the base uh, file I/O interfaces, the GUI library, um, the network library, an SQL library, a couple others that don't spring to mind. Um, first binaries of that were posted on the on the on the forum in late November, um, which was. It was actually, uh, until I actually prepared these slides, I'd, I'd forgotten it was only two weeks after I first said, hey, I'm looking at this, and you know, at that point I was like, oh, this, is, this is easy. Um, and by the first week of January, so yeah, I progressively then worked on all the necessary modules for the web engine, and the first build of the web engine was posted in January 2023. Next slide, please, Martin. Uh, the, web, the web engine. So there are there are 
in the order of 25,000 files that need to be compiled as part of the web engine. It is a big beast. Um, memory use is a real challenge. Um, so Ninja, which is a, uh, is a, uh, a, a bit like Jin, you make, but a, a more modern version of um, uh, make files. Um, by default, it runs four jobs. Um, Dimitri is limited to three jobs. Um, for OS2 based on memory usage, but there are some source files in, in this version of the web engine that if you compile with more than one job running at a time, you will run out of memory. Um, and it took me a while to work out that, um, you know, basically the, the system would just crack, um, completely freeze, um, you know, building certain parts of the code. And I eventually worked out that that was um, um, memory exhaustion. Um, and it's, you know, it's a two-edged sword. You know, if you want to guarantee a successful build, limit Ninja to one job, and it will take like three days to build, or run the gauntlet of running with more jobs, and you know, um, know that the build will break at certain points, and you'll have to run it for a little while with less jobs, and then at some point run the gauntlet again and, and kill that and restart it with more jobs to try and reduce the time. It's a it's a bit of the balancing act, um, but yeah, typically it's about thirty hours for a full rebuild, assuming that there's no interruptions um, and of course what tends to happen is you, um, you know you, you go to bed with a job running and an hour after you go to bed something breaks and you've lost you know in hours eight or, eight or nine hours overnight um, or you know you check it on the morning before you go to work and it's and it's ticking along and it's you know 15 minutes after you go to work it breaks just just the way the way things like to roll um, there are still some issues with node.js um, so node.js I guess processes some JavaScript files as part of building um, the web engine, and for, un for at this time unknown reasons, it sometimes creates zero byte files, which causes cause issues. I've managed to eliminate, I think, all bar one of those. There is a, a Node.js module called Tercer, and I've got no idea what it does. Um, but I discovered that um, if I hacked some of the build files to not run Tercer, I got larger JavaScript, larger JavaScript files. I think Tercer is supposed to um, effectively compress them. Um, I guess maybe hence the name Tursa, make it more terse. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a hack. So again, that's another thing that needs to be revisited at some point. As I mentioned it's about 30 hours for a rebuild and, and even relinking the DLL. So the DLL, the main web engine DLL that has Chromium code in it, is, has built about a 250 megabyte um, DLL. It's about 20 minutes just to link it. So you know, if, if you if you try and link it and something's changed and there's um, you know, a, a, some kind of linking error, it's another 20 minutes before you get down another crack, which is incredibly frustrating when you're sitting there waiting for it to finish running. Next slide, please, Martin. I think Steve actually said that it might be possible to cut back on the compile time of it considerably. I understand from the industry that compiling it on a, on a Mac does it in about four hours, and it's also, it's not just related to the amount of TCC processes running, but also some conversion between the binary formats, if I understood it correctly from Steve. So there might be a trick in the future to speed up the compiling considerably also without running more GCC processes, I think. Yeah, but using a, using a cross-compiler or something, Roderick? I don't know. I, I think it had to do with some changes to what, on, on code that would be added to open the Bobcom. It's, it's one of the issues that he has long had on his list for that. <coughs> It, it would be nice. I mean, certainly, um, you know, I've, I've, I've built elements of Qt on a on a Linux box just in some cases just to see differences in make files and just try and understand what might, might be going wrong. And you know, it certainly is much faster than you know my my Linux box has 16 gig of RAM and um, you know and a much faster processor as well, so it can run more jobs at once. But also fair to say that um, you know in, in in compiling Qt on this box. Um, it exhausts memory and then Chrome shuts itself down because it's got no memory. So the, you know, memory management is a, is a problem for everyone. It's just that they've got more, more to play with. <laughs> uh, so this is just a screenshot of, um, probably, I think this was the first image of um, uh, the first build of uh, Google running on um, QT6 uh, that I did post around at the time. Um, if I was sharing screens, I was actually going to be brave and, and uh, I did actually load this YouTube screen on Dual running it under OS2 on QT6 this morning and I was going to run the gauntlet and I had about a two-thirds success rate. Sometimes um, JavaScript got all hung up and, and didn't want to load, but um, 
I did get it running a number of times this morning and was going to do that, but because uh, I can't share screens, I'll, I'll, I'll have to just stick to the slides. Uh, so yeah, that was just a screenshot. Next slide, please, Martin. So um, that first build of um, Dibble that ran uh, YouTube certainly wasn't working with any reliability, um, guaranteed either um, freeze of the system or, or crash. Um, mm. That was basically a simpler issues. Um, again, between QT5 and QT6, they changed, get this right now, I think they were using YASM for, for assembly on um, QT5 and they're using NASM on QT6, if I remember right, or I might've got that around the wrong way. Um, so there was some um, changes required to assembler that where I couldn't just um, lift the code from QT5. Um, but yeah, I've been focusing on QT6.2 because it was a long-term release. Um, one of the things that changed at some point with QT from a licensing point of view is that they, um, after a certain point in time on the long-term support releases, they go to a commercial license where you only get the updated code if you um, pay them money. Um, but what they do do is um, open source the code 12 months after it's released under the commercial license. Um, so I got stuck on QT 6.2.4, so I started playing with 6.3, 6.4 and 6.5 and I I think I may have a status of, um, you know, I guess how how well they work on the next slide. Hopefully, really should have reread these slides last night. We'll hope that's coming up. Um, so the next slide has has, a, has an, an image of um, YouTube. Um, Friends or Rom are, are an Australian band um, who I, who I like, so uh, I, I had to use them as a as a as an image there. Um, if you like punk music, have a listen to Friends or Rom. Um, very witty lyrics. They like to take the piss. Um, next slide, please, Mun. Ah, I did, yeah. So QT 6.3 works pretty much the same as QT 6.2. And in fact, uh, in the last month, probably I updated QT 6.2 to 6.2.6. .6, and the Chromium version in that is actually identical to the Chromium version in 6.3. So. In the long-term releases, they're actually taking a newer Chromium release and, I guess, backporting it to the um, the earlier uh, QT library. So with QT 6.4, JavaScript basically is a complete no go. There's something going wrong there that I haven't had a chance to investigate. It just pages that don't have JavaScript, which is not many, uh, work for anything with JavaScript crashes. Um, QT 6.5 probably gets about 90% through the build. Um, and there's a tool called MK Snapshot, which is um, part of the V8 library um, with crashes. And didn't actually include the ticket in here, but um, Dimitri has a ticket that's been open for about 12 months on his port of Node.js, um, where he's got the exact same crash. So at some point, either, either me or Dimitri will fix that and we'll see how well QT 6.5 works. Um, so yeah, a lot of effort went into QT 6.4 and 6.5 and from a I guess from a, from a standalone application point of view, um, they work fine, but for, from a web, web engine point of view, um, they're just not usable for our platform at this stage. Next slide, please, Martin, while I have some water. So QT6, so the, the web engine code in QT is lifted straight from Chromium. Chromium is the open source um, implementation of the, the Google Chrome um, browser. Um, so obviously Chrome includes some proprietary code on top of that, but there is, um, you know, a strong relationship between Chromium and Chrome. But just for interest, I've just listed here um, what the base Chromium version is in the different QT versions, but then also, um, you know, current Chromium version is. So I, I, on my laptop, as of a week or so ago, um, is running uh, Chrome 119. Um, the most recent version of any QT, or the most recent version of Chromium in any QT is version 112 in QT 6.6, and that has some of the security fixes, um, basically from looks like almost the same build I was uh, running. But on QT 6.2.6, which is the most, I think the most usable build we currently have, that's running Chrome 94, which is, you know, essentially a couple of years old on the sort of monthly um, release cycle, but it still is able to render most pages. But uh, it's a serious challenge trying to keep this up to date with how part, how fast the pace of um, browser development is these days. Next slide, please, Martin. 
So I've kind of alluded to this, but um, after spending, I guess, a number of months trying to in, in uh, trying to uh, work on uh, P2 six point four and six point five and find the issues there, um, and I think partly because um, Lewis had mentioned to me about um, coming to talk to you guys, um, I thought I should put some energy into actually trying to get a I get a more stable build. Um, you know, in fact, bought some of the fixes that from newer versions um, and get them into Q2 6.2. Since the start of the year, 6.2.5 and 6.2.6 had been open source, um, which included a number of um, uh, you know bug fixes and security fixes. Um, and fair to say, um, the builds that I've recently posted are similar stability to the original um, 6.2.4 builds from the start of the year. But they're, they're you know, far from perfect. You know, Stephen did some, got it running a couple of days ago, and every now and then the browser will just close for no apparent reason. Um, that's some of the stuff that uh, we're trying to fix on, now, trying to work on now. Next slide, please, Martin. Uh, so current issues, um, as mentioned, um, all the code is in GitHub, and there are some issues um, documented in GitHub. But the primary issues um, are the, the silent exits, where you know, something in the code call, calls an exit. Uh, yeah, I think I've got a slide on that. Um, some people have experienced system hangs and and memory exhaustion. So sometimes, you know, particularly if you're running multiple tabs, um, it's not hard to run out of memory. And you know, having having run Chrome on a, on a Linux machine, not hard to run out of memory and end up using a swap on on Linux either. Um, it's just that it's Four times the amount of memory to play with. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. Paul, oh, on that topic there with the, with the group, we go back on page, Martin. No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> about those, about those crashes. Yeah, undo, control Z. Okay. Yeah, yeah. About those stability issues, I talked about it with Steve extensively and also with Dimitri. But I continue to keep understand, but I have time to look back at it with all the other stuff that I've been busy with. It, is there some indication that some of the crashes in the, when you run, because you said that you would run uh, the web browser with in, in not in single process mode, but multiple process mode? Uh, well, the, well for, for the Deagle builds, I've basically lifted all of Dimitri's patches to Deagle. So Deagle, I think Dimitri had forced into single process mode. Uh -huh. um, but I think single browser, um, or sorry, not single browser, single browser um, defaults to multi-process. So single browser, quite possibly, the crashes are a result of running in multi-process mode. Um, I know Dave, Dave Yo had, um, in one of the recent posts, had added a parameter you know, to force simple browser to run in single process mode, which frankly I didn't know existed. So some of it possibly, um, Roderick, is, is multi-process, but not in Google. Yeah, well, the only thing I know when I need to talk to Dimitri about that when he's back um, yeah, by the way, he missed uh, Phoenix by a week. He was here last week, so that's kind of a pity, but otherwise he could have joined us. But uh, there seems to be an indication, according to Dimitri, that those crashes occur because of some of the shared memory and thread code that's been implemented with C to get the WebKit code to work. But I've never had any concrete evidence of that, that that would actually be a part of the reasons why the WebKit engine just sometimes silently exits. Yeah, well, some of them, I mean, yeah, some, we fixed a couple of the solid exits where um, basically there was a variable that hadn't been assigned, which tends to be timing, mm -hmm. um, because you can run, you know, this, the same page three times and only get the, the solid exit once. Um, so it's definitely something timing-wise going on, and whether it's in Libsy, yeah, uh, above my level of capability, <laughs> okay. Okay. Dimitri would know far better than me, or Stephen. Uh, noting time, next slide, Martin. So, so silent exits, um, you know, when they first started appearing, they were just the, the, the browser would close, you'd get no except you trap or anything, um, no real intel on, on what was going on. Um, Steve, Stephen, frankly, had, had the brainwave of, um, well, something must be calling the exit in the code, and, you know, we can just force it trap. So um, I created a custom build of libc that Basically, every time the exit routine is run in Libc, it forces a trap. So what it does mean if you if you're running this version of the 
of FIBC and you run any application, you will get a trap file. Um, so not, not, not good for running on, a, on an operating system, but I did in the end um, get it to run only with um, the accept queue environment variable is, is set a certain way so that you can choose whether to enable this feature or not. Um, fair to say the, the report that it generates, um, I struggle to understand, but um, uh, the, with the wizard Stephen um, is able to interpret those and we've fixed a couple of exits um, or fixed is probably too strong a word. We've uh, implemented some hacks for a couple of um, exits to um, uh, to, to make, the, make the application not, not just to, not just crash out. Uh, next slide, Martin. So, yeah, what, what's next? Um, as time permits, um, as I said, noting that I do have a full-time job, um, I continue to work on fixing bugs and stabilising, so I do have a couple of weeks of leave coming up over Christmas, which if, if I'm not down the beach walking the dock or drinking wine, I'll probably be sitting on the computer playing with this. Um, and yeah, the other thing, you know, there is some feedback that you know, downloading zips and un unzipping things isn't the most user friendly. You know, it'd be nice to have a, either a warp-in package or an RPM package to make it easier for um, people to actually test. Next slide, please, Martin. So I thought I'd um, put in just a, a couple of slides on, on on how to help both the developers and um, and, and users. So developers, you know, there's there's lots of Beauty Six software out there, um, and one of the ways to find bugs is to try and port stuff and and see if it works. So you know, people like Robert Paul have done, you know, a, a huge amount of work on on porting different applications. Um, some of the open tickets that are out there, uh, queue process, for example, um, the way that is implemented um, between Beauty Five and Beauty Six changed quite a bit, and um, this is all about you know uh, spawning applications and then um, uh, seeing the return code that come from those and deciding how PT handles it. There's issues there which I don't think are hard, but they're too hard for me. Um, but things like QT Creator, um, which, as I understand, it is an easy way to create QT applications um, through a GUI interface. Um, at the moment, uh, when you try and configure that and it looks for a GCC version, for example. It can't get the version of GCC. It runs it. I can see that it runs it, but it's it's just not getting the output. Whether it's a pipe issue or anyway, I, I've spent a bunch of time on it and haven't done very well. Um, I'm sure someone with a little bit of you know more OS2 API knowledge, because I don't a whole lot of OS2 API, could fix that relatively easily. Um, there's no audio backend in Qt Multimedia, so the the audio that happens through the web engine in Chrome is a bespoke code for to Chromium. Um, again, that's probably not difficult for someone who's used, you know, libpy or has done MMPM programming previously. Um, I haven't. Um, and yeah, even just trying to build the QD6 library. So um, I know uh, Dave Yo and Elbert have at various times, and probably others um, have built various parts. But you know, the, the more people that try and build the code, um, you know, the more issues we'll find and can fix and make it easier for others to, um, to have a crack. Next slide, please, Martin. <laughs> uh, I, I must have I must have been drinking red wine when I was doing this. <laughs> yeah. So um, testing, there's a couple of threads that uh, always do well. There's one for application testing and there's one for development updates. In the application testing thread, there is a, a, a sticky thread which um, Martin very kindly um, edits to update the latest builds. Um, but yeah, not very subtle there, but um, and frankly, this is a bit of the recurring theme in, in general, but you know, lots of stuff I've published and put out there and you hear nothing back. And so you, you know, the assumption is, well, obviously no one's interested in X, um, when actually that's not necessarily the case. So even if it's a, hey, I, I, I tried your port of X and it works well, please please keep updating it. Um, if, if, if you don't hear the people using it, you assume people aren't and you stop updating it. And I know that's not just me. Uh, so I'll get off my, um, uh, what do I call it? Uh, I'll, get off, I'll get off my, uh, get off the, uh, back of the word. I'll stop my lecture now. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. I think I'm just about at the end. So I, I thought I'd put some sort of credits in here. Um, Dimitri, for all the work he did on QC4 and QD5, as I've said a couple of times, um, without that work, we would not be talking on this topic. Today. We might be talking on another topic, but we wouldn't be talking on that. 
Um, you know, Rod Rod Roderick, um, I think it's fair to say that if, if it wasn't for all the work he did on um, generating interest and donations and things, um, QT5 wouldn't have existed, and again, we wouldn't be here today. Um, Dave Yeo and Dave McKenna, they've done a huge amount of work in terms of testing and providing feedback in the OSD world thread. Um, I'm sure there's others that, when I put this together, they were the two names that um, sprung to mind. Um, Earl Witt's done a bunch of work filing stuff and in the process found some issues and, re and reported them as well, which has been helpful. Um, Arden, you know, your help with the, with the OST world thread and even just keeping the OST world alive. Um, Stephen for his help in debugging. And there's, and there's one line that is on my local copy that I have this morning that you guys don't have, um, just the NetLabs channel and IRC. It's just another forum just to, you know, to talk with other users and um, bounce ideas. Um, back your old school, I still like IRC. And next slide, Martin, which I think is questions. With two minutes to go, despite the technology challenges. Yeah. <laughs> no, no further. You want me? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I no, shot no. mine right out. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Paul, do you think GCC 12 is like uh, mature enough to, to be posted on the RPM, like on mainstream? It works for everything I've tested it with, and I file a bunch of stuff locally. Um, there's, probably, there's probably some fixes from the Bitwise GitHub that may not be in it. Um, uh, I, I have a biased opinion, you know, I, I, GCC 9, for example, um, was ready for prime time a long time before Bitwise, um, yeah, took that code and, 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 uh, you know, updated their repo, you know, they were still on 4.9 for, you know, in my opinion, way longer than necessary, uh, but that's not my call, so. Okay, okay, so. I'm going but the, to but the, but the sorry, man. The, the 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 build I posted in OS2 World um, installs in a separate uh, directory, so um, you know you can drop it on top of an RPM build and update your path to point to USR local 1230 slash bin, and it can it, it can exist in parallel with um, the RPM build. Okay. So it's you know unzip a file and update your path, and you've got a yes, it's not an RPM because. Frankly, I've looked it up here a couple of times and it confuses me and hurts my head and I can either spend time trying to work it out and understand it or I can spend time fixing stuff and I choose to spend time fixing stuff instead of rolling it wrongly. Okay, okay. If someone wants to create an RPM, do your boots. Yeah, we can look at doing an RPM. Yeah. We can look at doing an RPM. Oh, hi, Lewis. Hey, Paul. Right. <laughs> I'm just going to sneak in the back earlier. <laughs> There is a, there's some application, and I forget the name of it. Um, someone someone on NetLabs mentioned it um, that can distribute builds across multiple machines, um, which I guess in theory is, is basically what you're describing. Um, I guess what part of what I'm I did start to play with Ninja to um, Ninja can do some stuff like if um, based on CPU CPU usage and things, um, you know, not spawn more jobs. You know, if, if that could somehow look at how much free memory was available and then make a call on, do I start another job or do I wait for memory use to drop down? That may actually do what we need to do, but it's, again, it's time. And the other thing I found is that as soon as I changed the Ninja binary, um, Ninja then said, oh, I've changed version. I'm gonna go and rebuild every single file in the repository and then you're having to rebuild 25,000 files again. So without a simple test case that you know is gonna exhaust you know, consume two and a half gig of RAM in one job. 
it's hard to actually implement a solution. <laughs> but for now, I, I, I make do. It's, you know, there's a certain, the certain portion of the build process where um, you hit those issues where the, you know, the, the, the jobs that consume more memory. Um, and I just, you know, basically when that happens, I'll just run with one job for a couple of hours and then roll the dice on um, increasing the number of jobs again and, and see how far I get. And there's a few reboots and a little bit of swearing along the way, but it's, it's manageable. But yeah, it, it is a good idea. And yeah, there is a tool that in theory can do it. I just can't recall the name of it off hand. Um, it would need to be, you know, I guess, adapted to um, run an OS2, you know, how um, Unix dependent um, that tool is, I don't know. How, how customized is your OS2 build environment to the way you do things or, versus telling someone else set up these 10 things and you'll have the exact same environment I have? <laughs> you see what I mean? So, I'm not a developer, so, but can you relay enough instructions that someone else can build your environment and possibly help you with the compile time problems you're having? So I'll, 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 I'll separate my answer into two. From a QT6 perspective, that is basically running with an RPM build environment. Okay. Um, be, mainly because you know some of the dependencies and things and just wanting to make it easier for people to run and some of the, particularly the multimedia libraries, I only had older versions, and again, do I spend a bunch of time recompiling stuff or, 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 or not, you know, not worth the effort. But from a Qt6 perspective, provided all the requisite development libraries are installed, which are largely the same as the Qt5 ones and are documented in, um, um, you know, the, the bitwise GitHub pages, um, Qt6 should not be hard to replicate my environment. Some of the other stuff, that environment's a bit of a basket case, frankly. And I'm, you know, the stuff I'm building more recently, I'm trying to build on a little, little Lenovo box, um, which is basically a, you know, a more standard build environment because it's just, it's just too much maintenance. It's, it works for some stuff. And you know, Samba, for example, I've tried to build on the, um, the, the, the Lenovo and um, hit issues. Um, so I'll try and, you know, at, as time permits. Um, get that working under a more standard environment as well, because yeah, it's just not sustainable. At, at one point I was um, you know, offering zips of my build environment, um, but even that it's, you know, it, it's just got out of control, frankly. But from a QT6 perspective, shouldn't be hard to replicate in a, GC, in a um, RPM GCC environment. But have a crack and post your experiences and um, if there's some documentation that needs to be, right, needs to be written on uh, what needs to change, we can flesh that out and add it to GitHub. Paul, if you want to help build RPM files, there's actually something that I'll announce on, on, some, on Sunday. And I've been trying to scrape together all the, what I call the remaining OS2 developers like the you know, Andy, etc. But I think what would be much more better is if all the developers stick their heads together, that you can spend your spend your brain power on coding. I can't match your coding just I can't match Dimitri. So the question is, could we maybe have other people help you build RPM files so that you can do what you're good at? That project has the title of the GCC factory to try and get all the smart brains of the community together and work together on a single mailing list. And then, for example, if you have a package that somebody else can package it, test it. And I also want to put up a test server where those packages can be checked out and go through some scripted testing that I discussed with Steve, but I simply need more hands and feet to get it done. So, but that would be probably a more efficient way, I think, if you can just continue coding and not build RPM files, unless you like that as a distraction. But I think you're- No, I, 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 I don't. <laughs> <laughs> also, Is it subtle enough? Doesn't CMake, CMake has the ability to package RPMs, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's not, the problem, it's not the problem of building an RPM file later on, it's, the, it's building a proper one that does dependency checking. You need to put the knowledge in the file so that when it builds the RPM, that it knows, hey, I need all of these files and it's this version. That's the hard part of it, usually. I, mean, I think CMake knows that because when it's building the code, 
COVID. Next year, what we'll do is we'll have a, and Neil, try to remember this yeah. for our post event thing. Next year, we should have a session on building RPMs, yeah, specifically for ARCA OS, because um, I'm telling you that like a good paint job is 90% preparation and 10% application. Yeah. A good RPM is 90% spec file and 10% building. Yeah. And you know you could spend days writing a spec file to, to do exactly what you wanted to do. And building the, the package is quick and easy and simple. I mean, RPM build doesn't care how bad your spec file is. It will dutifully build whatever you feed it. So that's the whole, the whole trick is getting a spec file the way you want it. I think the best place to get a glimpse of what it is, Bitwiseworks has a repository somewhere with pretty good examples in it. It even shows you how to build workplace shell objects in Rex. Then at least you've got a template mm -hmm. to look at how it works. Mm -hmm. And then there's some OC specific things in it. So then you can actually build, yeah. install it, but then you can actually also create an icon in a specific folder <coughs> Yes, we are. We are. Okay. And the beach is and the beach is full. Yeah. Yeah. More slides. Ten more slides. Okay. I think I think they were they were basically a um a, a thank you and a and the and the license slide. So yeah, the question essentially was the last slide. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Take care. You too. Take care, Paul. Thanks. Thanks a lot.